Last couple of weeks we were talking about repentance and penitence. And the good news, of course, is as, well, at first as a sinner, when we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our eternity is sealed in heaven. And as Christians, occasionally we might stumble, might fall, might sin. We can confess our sins and repent. And God forgives us when we are truly sorry for our sins. Now today I just want to talk about the assurance of our eternal life in heaven this morning. So uh, this will be should be a positive and uplifting and encouraging sermon this morning as we think about our, our eternity and that our eternity is sealed forevermore in God's heaven. In the early days of radio in Great Britain, George Bernard Shaw, some of you older folks may know that name, he was a journalist and a playwright, was giving a talk about the peculiarities of the English language. In, uh, in the course of which he mentioned that there are only two words in English which begin with the sh sound, the sh, sh sound, sh, but are not spelled with an sh. One listener wrote in to say that she did not believe the statement to be true or accurate. She said there was only one such word, sugar, S-U-G-A-R, but it has that sh, that sh sound to it. She said there's only one such word in the English language, sugar. She received a postcard in reply from George Bernard Shaw. I wish there was just one sentence. Madam, are you sure? So we can never always be sure, or we always think we're certain of different things, but we can, sometimes we can be sure, and sometimes we can't always be sure. But the one thing that we can have the assurance of, there's another word that kind of incorporates that, the assurance of knowing that our eternity is sealed in heaven. So John wrote a letter, 1 John, so that those reading it could be certain or sure of eternal life. And he gives us the assurances that we have as believers. So this morning, let's turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. I love reading through the epistles of John. They're easy to read through. You can read through them all in just a short period of time, less than a half an hour. They're, they're short uh, letters, uh, full of good theology, full of good information, full of good encouragement. 1 John 5.11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of Him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall be given him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we'll stop there and pick it up in just a few minutes. But we are assured of eternal life there. In verse 11, this is the record, this is the truth, this is the written document, this is the contract that we have, that God hath given us eternal life, and it's through his Son. So everybody here this morning who has proclaimed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you, you confess that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. You believe that in your heart. You have the contract with God. He has given us eternal life. So you have eternal life with God. So congratulations. Can't wait till we get there one day. It's just, you know, if you read the descriptions of heaven in, in Revelation and a few other hints here and there uh, throughout the Bible, I just can't imagine what it's going to look like. You try to in your mind's eye, and you can even go on the computer and you can Google, you know, beautiful places or beautiful, you know, neighborhoods or something like that, and, and it just doesn't even, it, it pales in comparison to what, what heaven's going to look like. You know, we think about streets of gold and mansions, and everybody has in their mind's eye this huge city, and it's going to be a huge city, vertical and horizontal and, and so forth, uh, but... Um, and, and it's just building after building after building with, you know, spotless, no, no litter, you know, the, everything is bright and shiny. But heaven's going to be so much more than just that. There's going to be wide vistas. And, you know, the earth was, was created in, in a sort of a mirror image of heaven at one point. And we weren't there, unfortunately, in the Garden of Eden to see even just a glimpse of what heaven might be like. But if you can think of everything perfect, not a single weed, not a single dandelion, not a, not, nothing out of place, you know. Think of Longwood Gardens on, on multiple steroids, maybe, and, and just even kind of give you a clue a little bit. But heaven's going to be just this perfect, beautiful place. And we get to live there forever and ever and ever. Amen. So we have that eternal life. It's guaranteed to us. It's right there. It's in writing God's contract with us. It's yours. 
But he goes on, he wants us to understand that even though that is given to us, it doesn't mean that we can just rest on our laurels, that we can just kind of skate through life for the rest of our time that we're here, and it's just ease into heaven. We've got work to do. We've got a job for us to do. And our inheritance will depend on what we do with the time that we have from the time we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to the time we leave this earth. So there are things to, to do in, in the meantime. And this is the record, again, in verse 11, God has given us eternal life. Life is in His Son. Verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So there's the first thing that we can do. We all know people who do not have the Son, who do not confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So the first thing we can do, if we did nothing else, is to try to be a witness to those people, to somehow share our glorious experience, our personal experience, when we were converted, and we convert from the old man to the new man, from our sin state to our grace state, and try to impress that upon other people so that they can enjoy the same blessings that we enjoy, including a promise of eternal life. We can have the assurance because our eternal life and salvation is not based on the things that we've done for God, but what God has done for us. Because we can never earn it. We would never deserve it to, to get to heaven. Now the only way we have eternal life is through faith alone and Christ alone. And that relationship with God and that dwelling of His Holy Spirit comes to us through Jesus Christ. So how do we know we have that promise of eternal life? How do we know we have that gift of salvation? Because the Holy Spirit resides in us. And that Holy Spirit is, uh, some people refer to it as our conscience. Uh, although that's part of it, but that's just a, a small part of it. But when you're reading the Bible and something leaps out at you on the page, that's the Holy Spirit grabbing you by the collar and shaking you and saying, that one was for you. It might be a blessing, might be a challenge, might be a, an admonishment, might be a correction. But when something leaps out at you, when you hear something on, uh, when you read something on the computer, somebody, you know, people love to post Bible verses on social media all the time. And that's wonderful. And sometimes when you're reading that, you say, oh, wait a minute, you're scrolling down, scrolling down, and something just pops out at you and you have to stop and you have to read it. Maybe read it two or three times. That's the Holy Spirit saying, this one's for you. You know, it might be for 20 other people as well, but it, it's for you too. So the Word of God never returns to Him void. Jesus Christ is the only way for us to have eternal life, the only one who can give eternal life. We've been talking about this in Sunday school the uh, last several weeks in the uh, Gospel of Mark. And uh, just last week and this week, we are talking about the crucifixion and the, and the resurrection uh, as it's described in Mark. And that is the proof that Jesus, even the disciples had doubts, even the disciples, we learned, fled, especially Peter, who denied Jesus three times. And uh, when, when Jesus rose again, we're talking about this this morning. The, the ladies went to the, the tomb. The stone was rolled away. There was an angel inside saying, Jesus, whom you seek, is not here. Go tell the disciples and Peter. And that was God's mercy, saying, you know what? I, I told Peter he was going to deny me three times. He said he would never deny me. Well, he denied me three times. But I still love him. And I'll still forgive him because God knew that Peter was repentant. Remember after the third time, he ran out and he cried because he knew that he had denied his Lord and Savior three times and he was sorrowful and he was repentant and just as we talked about the last couple of weeks and he, was, he confessed that. And God wanted Peter specifically to know that despite denying him three times after promising to his face that he would never do that, that God still forgave him. So go tell the disciples and Peter that he is no longer here. So... The same blessing and mercy applies to us as well. So even if we deny God, even if we trip and stumble, if we commit a horrible sin, God still forgives us when we come to Him humbly and confess and repent of that sin. It's the only way we can have eternal life. Forgiveness of sins does not come by our good works or ability to achieve a higher level of spirituality or knowledge that unlocks a secret heaven or a secret door or a secret pathway or secret light. The, the New Age movement is all about opening up secrets and finding the real you and the real path to, to enlightenment and so forth. And it's got nothing to do with that. A relationship with God is not achieved through personal enlightenment, but through Jesus Christ shed blood on the cross. Back in 1 John 2, verse 2, it says, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So He is the, substitute, he is the the sacrifice, the substitute for us, for everybody in the world. But we know that not everybody is going to accept that gift. Jesus was our substitute, our sacrifice for sins. He took upon Himself all of the sin that you've ever committed on that cross, was nailed to that cross. So you need to leave it there and allow the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ to wash you whiter than snow. John gives us another area in which we can have the assurance as believers and tells us something that we can count on 
and rest in is that God hears our prayers in verses 14 and 15 there, 1 John chapter 5, 14, 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, that's the phrase that trips a lot of people up. That's the phrase that trips up a lot of the uh, name it and claim it crowd uh, in uh, Christendom. According to His will, He heareth us. Not what they would like to read is, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything, He heareth us. They would prefer to leave that little phrase out there, but that's a very, very important phrase, according to His will. When we pray a prayer, we say, Thy will be done. We say it when we, read, when we recite the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So, and He hears us. Verse 15, And if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desired of Him. If you look at it the other way, if we ask anything but not according to His will, according to our will, He doesn't hear us. He ignores us. It's not a proper prayer because it's according to our will. My will is that I be rich and famous. My will is that I have a uh, mansion on the hillside. My will is that I can uh, quit my job and just uh, live comfortably for the rest of my life and, and uh, live by the beach, live by the mountains, move around, be a, live the life of a jet setter. That's my will. Well, that's the human nature will, but that's not God's will. So if we do not pray according to His will, He does not hear us. It works it works both ways. If we know that He hears us because we prayed according to His will, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desired of Him. Well, what are you going to ask Jesus for? What are you going to ask God for? Whatever you ask for, it better be according to His will. What's His will? The will is, is outlined right here in the Bible. You pray according to the Word of God, you will always receive the answer to your prayer. But you have to be according to the will and the Word of God. What does God's model for our Christian life look like to serve others. What did Jesus do to the disciples uh, during the, the Last Supper to show his, his uh, servanthood? He washed their feet. It wasn't about himself. It wasn't about receiving all the glory himself. It wasn't about the disciples washing his feet. Remember, he goes again and says, uh, you know, let me wash your feet. You know, no, 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 don't wash. I'll wash your feet. Well, no. God said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. Then wash my whole body. So, Praying according to God's will means, God, let me show me how I can serve other people. Give me an opportunity to be a blessing to other people. Give me an opportunity to witness to other people. Give me an opportunity to minister in the name of Jesus Christ. That's a prayer according to God's will, and that's a prayer that He will answer each and every time. We have to pray according to His will, and then He'll hear us. Verse 16, If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life. For them that sin not unto death. We'll go on to the next part of here in just a moment, but there is people in our lives that we can pray for that are in sin. Probably family, friends, co-workers, it could be anybody who are sinning, and we need to pray for them. We need to intercede for them so that, the, that God uh, will have mercy upon them, that the Holy Spirit will burden their heart, and that they will humble themselves, because what it is is Christianity, salvation is an act of humility. It's humbling ourselves, it's admitting that we cannot get to heaven on our own works, and our own efforts, by being a good person. We just can't do that. We're not good enough. Never will be good enough. Only by God's grace will we ever get there. So, it points to the fact that we can pray for other people, witness to other people, but they still have to make the, the decision. They still have to humble themselves to the point and admit that, God, I can't do it. I cannot be righteous enough. I cannot do enough good things on my own. So I need your help. I need to place my faith and trust in you because you can and you have done all the work that, that allows me to move. Uh, and it allows me to achieve salvation and then to experience eternal life forevermore. When they're willing to get to that part of their life where they humble themselves, then we have the opportunity that, to see their lives truly change. John points us to our right and privilege to speak with God. And we can actually talk to God and know that He hears us when we pray according to His will. Even if we haven't seen Him physically, we know that He hears our prayers. So think of all the prayers that He has answered. We heard the example earlier today. Or just a simple prayer or a series of prayers and God answers them in, in unusual ways. Usually it's ways we never think about. You know, it's usually something, and I think it's God's way of just saying, just trust me, you know, you think you know the best way. I'm going to do something a little different that you weren't expecting just to show that it was my hand that was moving. Just to prove to you that it was me, God, and my power that brought that answer to prayer into your life. There's a, maybe, probably could have been, you know, a dozen different ways that the Egoff's prayers could have been met. God chose one way that maybe they weren't even expecting. 
I don't know. But God chose a way. And that way we can only say it must have been God because, you know, we had all these other plans. We were going to call this person or that person. We we're going to take it into our into our ourselves. We we're going to, you know, handle it ourselves. And God said, watch this. I am the God of trees. And I'm going to bring the trees down when they need to come down. And don't worry, I'll, I'll spare anybody on the ground. Nobody's going to get hurt. That's just God saying, I'm God and you trust in me, so here you go. Here's a gift. Now, and then, not only that, how are we going to haul this thing away? Well, I've got some... God, don't worry, i got that covered too. Don't worry. I'm going to send somebody along. We'll take it out of there for you. So, Chris is over there sitting large thinking, I don't have to cut it down, I don't have to cut it up, I don't have to haul it away. You know, I can spend time with my family. Maybe some time more in prayer. Maybe there's other things now that they can be praying about instead of that because that prayer has been answered. Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Come boldly before the throne. Don't be embarrassed to go to God. Because you go to God, He is your Father, your Heavenly Father. How much, you know, if He knows the number of hairs on your head, He knows when a sparrow falls out of the sky, how much more does He care about you who He created in His image? For companionship. Man was created for God to have somebody to walk and talk with and to have a friendship with and have fellowship with. He cares about you. How much do you care about your best friend? God cares about you even more than you care about your best friend. So we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Children have no trouble coming boldly to their parents. Mom, Dad, I want candy. I want ice cream. I want this toy. I want that thing. Anybody who's been a parent uh, or a grandparent knows that children have no problem coming boldly to the throne of the family. Mom and Dad saying, give me this. I want this. Well, we can come boldly to the throne of God according to His will, and we can request the things as well. God, show me how I can be more effective witness for you. Show me how I can launch into a powerful ministry uh, for your honor and glory. Show me how I can become more involved in my church or in a community and a Christian uh, ministry of some sort. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. Show me how I can be an even more effective witness to the one person I've been praying for and praying for. Their heart just seems hard and and stone cold, they just don't want to have anything to do with Christianity or the church. I've invited them to church. I've, I've, I've tried to pray with them. I've tried to send them Bible verses. They just continue to push me away. We can come boldly to the throne of God and say, God, show me how to penetrate that defensive wall. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Hebrews 10, 9, 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Draw near to God, full assurance of faith. God is always true to his word. We can come boldly to the throne in a full assurance of faith, and we can draw near to him. And God is always near to us. So we should not be embarrassed. We should not be intimidated. Some people are a little intimidated by God. God is up there on His throne. He's got lightning bolts in His hand. He's ready to nail anybody who steps out of line. Well, that's not the God of mercy and grace that I know. Sometimes there is discipline, but guess who deserves the discipline when we get it? We deserve it because we've stepped out of line. When you discipline your children, why do you do it? Because they deserve it. So you have different ways of disciplining your children, and it's no different between our relationship and God the Father. If we sin, there may be consequences. There may be discipline because it's our fault. Not because God is angry and wants to punish people. God doesn't, doesn't enjoy punishing anybody. He loves us. He said His only begotten Son to die for us. He would prefer that we just have a loving communion, uh, fellowship, and relationship for all eternity, starting today and going forward. That would be His desire. As believers, we have the unique privilege of having access to God and knowing that He hears our prayers and He answers our prayers. There was a journalist who was assigned to the paper's Jerusalem Bureau in Israel. She had an apartment overlooking the Wailing Wall. That's where the Jews pray, the remnants of the, the temple. Every day she would look out and see an old Jewish man praying fervently. One day she decided to go down and introduce herself to the old man. She asked, do you come down here every day to the wall? Or she said, you, you seem to come down here every day to the wall. How long have you done that and what are you praying for? He said, I've been coming here for 25 years. In the morning, I pray for world peace and then for the brotherhood of man. I go home, have a cup of tea, and I come back and I pray for the eradication of illness and disease from the earth. The journalist was just amazed and asked, well, how does it make you feel coming here every day for 25 years 
praying for these things. The old man looked up at her with a sad and distant look on his face and said, it feels like I'm talking to a wall. <laughs> wall is going to save you. Wall is going to hear your prayers. God, the Father, we pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus. He's the one who hears our prayers. Now you may say, I've been praying for something for a long time and maybe it feels like my prayers aren't getting any higher than the ceiling. Just hit bouncing off the ceiling and coming back to me. But I can assure you as you pray according to the will of God, He hears your prayers. He may not answer when you think it should be answered. In fact, rarely does. But He'll answer it in the perfect time that it needs to be answered. And then when that happens, don't you look back and say, well, obviously God did know better. He was hearing my prayers all this time, even though I was starting to have some doubt. But he knew when the, when, what the answer should be, and he knew when to provide the answer. So if you ever feel like that way, when you pray, remember you're talking to your Heavenly Father who has loved you with an everlasting love. And His presence is within you by His Holy Spirit. God will give us what we ask for, but He does not leave that open-ended as we talked about this before. He, like the other New Testament writers, doesn't present pray as a magic key, John doesn't, that unlocks heaven's treasure's chest to anything and everything that you think is good for you or around you. Sometimes we forget that prayer is not about answers, but it's about relationship with God. Talking to somebody. You want to ever have a, a situation in your life where you just wanted to talk to somebody, you weren't looking for them to provide the, the magic answer or the perfect response. I think uh, husbands and wives do this a lot if they have a healthy relationship. Sometimes one of them just wants to talk. They're not looking for the wisdom of Solomon to come out of their spouse or their best friend, whoever it is that they're talking to. But they just want, they just want somebody to talk. And maybe they don't even want you to respond. They just need to unload. That does happen sometimes. Well, God is there and He hears your prayers. And He wants to talk to you as well. But sometimes you can just, you know, you want to talk and unload on God. Sometimes He wants to talk to you. And sometimes he wants you to shut up so that he can just talk to you and minister to you as well. But your mind is going a thousand different places and sometimes you just need to be quiet. Lock yourself in your prayer closet and just listen. And just listen. God loves to talk to his people. Loves to talk to his children. Verse 14 there in 1 John 5. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he heareth us. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. There's a condition. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Again, people like to skip over that part. If you abide in me, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, my words have to abide in you as well. That's the Word of God. That's Scripture. So if you want to know how to pray according to God's will, you have to know the Scripture, because that's what you're praying by. According to Scripture, thy will be done. So prayer is not about God granting our wishes, but about guidance, guiding His children throughout the course of their life. It's not about getting our will done in heaven, but getting heaven's will done here in our life on earth. Prayer is also not about getting God to see things our way, but about getting us to submit to His way and to His will. Prayer, if it's done correctly, should also be done in an attitude of humility. God, I don't know everything. In fact, there's very I, I, there's more that I don't know the more that I do know about you and your nature, but I want to become more like you. I want to become more knowledgeable. I want to know more about you. And I can only do that, and you can only get to know people if you spend time with them. How did you get to know your best friend? How did you get to know your spouse? How did you get to know the person at work that's uh, maybe a good friend that you go to lunch with from time to time? By spending time with them, getting to know them, talking about what their interests are. What are they like? What do they spend their free time doing? What do they like to read? What kind of movies do they like to watch? Tell me about your family. Those kinds of things. And you get to know somebody, you build a rapport over time. But it's the same way with our relationship with God. We should ask God a question. Tell me about your family, God. Tell me about your son. Tell me about the Holy Spirit. Tell me about the angels in heaven. Tell me about your creation. Tell me about your word. Tell me about the prophets of old. And God has given you a lot of background already. Tell me what you want me to do with my life. As you start to get to know each other. and Have this conversation back and forth. Prayer is not a one-way conversation, although we often treat it that way. John tells us that prayer, God answers in the affirmative with a yes is the one that we have offered in his will. Now verse 16 and 17, If a man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life, for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin. There is a sin not unto death. Now this is an interesting twist of uh, phrases here in this, this letter. 
And it troubles a lot of people. And I had to look it up, and I was looking through several different commentators, because they, and they do not all agree at what John was really trying to portray here. There is a sin that is not unto death. Okay, well, that would be most sin. You know, any sin that you commit, you can confess your sin and repent of your sin. God forgives you. You move on. We mentioned again this morning in Sunday school, Peter said, how many times should I forgive a brother who has done, some, done me wrong? Seven times. Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. Because that's the way God forgives us. How many times, seven times have you had to ask God to forgive you of something in your life? Innumerable. I can't count the number of times. And he's forgiven me every single time. But there is a sin that is unto death. So in keeping with the understanding of how sin in the life of people is understood throughout the rest of this letter, we need to look at the condition of the heart. And, and John mentioned sin that's unto death and sin that's not unto death. So what would the sin unto death be? It will be a sin that is never given up, a sin that is committed that cannot be forgiven. We often refer to it as the unpardonable sin, a, a, sin, a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. The blasphemy of the, 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 blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is often misunderstood. And people think, well, what if I just, if I curse the Holy Spirit, then I blaspheme the Holy Spirit and I can never be forgiven. Some people have actually tried to make a point of that who are atheists and say, well, see what? I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I used uh, cuss words or a curse or whatever it is. I'm still alive. I've been struck by a lightning bolt. There is no God. But the problem is, if your heart is so hard that you will not even get to the point where you would even entertain humbling yourself to the point. Even if the Holy Spirit burns you, you're so coarse and so callous and so hard that you would never, would never, and could never humble yourself and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you have committed the unpardonable sin. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit comes to everybody with an, an invitation to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We've all accepted that. Praise God for that. But there are some people where he's come and they've been rejected, come and rejected, come and rejected, come and rejected over and over and over again, at some point in time, some people, and I think it's a very small uh, number of people, but there are some people who have gotten so callous, no matter what you could possibly do, if Jesus materialized in front of them, manifested himself physically in front of them, they would still reject it, still uh, not accept him as the Son of God. Then you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit because you rejected him to such a point where your heart is so cold and so callous, you cannot become born again. In Corinthians, the church, we see that Paul made the statement that some of their members had died because of how they abused the Lord's table. Now here's talking about a sin unto death and dishonored God in their worship. Ananias and Sapphira, remember them in Acts chapter 5, where they lied to the Holy Spirit. They were to, said, I'm going to go and sell a piece of property. I'm going to give it to the church. Well, they held some of it back. And uh, Ananias uh, came in and he lied to the people. And he said, yes, here you go. It's everything. And then he dropped dead like that. His wife came in a little later. They carried him out. Wife came in a little bit later, Sapphira didn't know what had happened to her husband. She lied as well, dropped dead just like that. They carried her out. You have to be very careful when you're, what's your motivation? Where is your heart in these things? John is saying that once God has set his will and acted in taking the life of whatever reasons, uh, for whatever reasons, your prayer, while John did not tell you not to pray, will not affect change because they are against the decision of a sovereign God who has sealed the fate of that individual. So he's saying there that God, John, God is, what John is saying is that God has a will in mind. He has a will, a perfect will, for your life. And he wants you to follow that perfect will. And the only way to find and discover that perfect will is to ask and to seek guidance. And he may give it to you through the Word of God. He may give it to you through prayer. He may send a brother or sister, a Christian brother or sister to you and help lead you and guide you. To that, to that way. It may be through circumstances. I've mentioned many times here in the church, the reason I'm standing behind this pulpit is through a set of circumstances that were beyond my control at the time, with my parents getting ill and coming back and trying to figure out what to do with the church, and God ultimately leading me to a pastorate. But it wasn't because uh, something specifically I've read out of the Bible at that particular time, although I've been led that way many times as well. It wasn't because I heard an audible voice saying, Thou shalt be the next pastor of the Bible church. It wasn't anything like that. It was a set of circumstances, but I just knew in my heart, once, it was con once I realized what God was trying to tell me, then the confirmation came as a sense of peace and, and understanding that this is what God had for me in mind for this particular period of my life. God has something in mind for you as well. You may already know what it is. You may already be well involved in that. Praise God. Continue on. Continue to be a champion for Christ and whatever it is that God has called you to do. And, and uh, just know, have the assurance that when you get to heaven, there will be... Uh, rewards waiting for you. For those of you who are not sure, keep praying, keep seeking and searching. 
Hebrews 12, 15, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it may be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. As far as I know, everybody here this morning has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and I get that from talking to you and watching you live your lives, and, and so we have the assurance of salvation, but again, there are people in our lives that we know that are falling short of that standard. What can we do to convince them to, well, we don't have to convince them. You're going to think, what, what can I do to convince you that you need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? All you can do is witness to them. The Holy Spirit does the, the convincing. There is no sin that God cannot and will not forgive if that person sought God's forgiveness in faith and repentance. The way you know that somebody has not committed the impardonable sin is because they are willing to seek God's will for their life. If they are willing to admit that they have sinned, it doesn't matter how many bad sins they've committed or how awful they've been. They could be the worst criminal in the history of the world or they could be the most uh, disgusting person you've ever met. But if they come to the point where they realize that they're lacking a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, they have not committed the unpardonable sin. David was an adulterer and murderer, King David. The Apostle Paul persecuted the church and murdered. Peter cursed and denied Jesus Christ to save his own life, not once, not twice, but three times, all in heaven. We'll get to meet them all one day. It'd be kind of cool to talk about their lives and what the lessons they learned. And in particular, I like to ask them about things that weren't recorded in the Bible. Imagine if we had their entire lives recorded in the Bible. It would be stacks and stacks and stacks of Bibles just for each one of single one of them. So we'll have all eternity to kind of to talk to them and figure out what exactly was going on in their lives. What were they thinking at the time when these different situations occurred in their life? Verses 18 and 19 of 1 John 5, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Satan does not touch you when you are with God. He may tempt you, but he can't touch you. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. He's, in other words, he's saying Satan can't steal your soul. Satan can't remove your reward of eternal life for Jesus Christ. Once you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about him stealing from you. It can't happen. So, he can tempt you, he can try to make you sin, he can try to make you ineffective as a Christian, but he can't steal your salvation. We have been given victory over sin. And in verses 20 and 21, we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Several years uh, back, 100 decoy albatrosses were placed on the Izu Islands of Japan to attract endangered albatrosses and encourage them to breed. Kind of decoys, basically what they were. For more than two years, a five-year-old albatross named Deco tried to woo a wooden decoy by building fancy nests and fighting off rival suitors, spent his days standing faithfully by her side. Researchers said that Deco seemed to have no desire to date real birds. So it is with people who put their affections upon the gods of this world instead of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Trying to date the gods of this world, trying to cozy up to the gods of this world as if the gods of this world could ever satisfy them for all eternity. The God of money, the God of fame, the God of uh, substance abuse, the God of whatever it might be that, that uh, takes over people's lives. So it is with people who put their affections on the gods of this world instead of the true God, the God of the universe, the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. So let's not reject what is true for what is fake. We can be assured that Jesus Christ truly is the real deal. Let's continue to pray for those people in our lives that we know that have fallen into this trap of the world and getting ahead for themselves and finding out that life really is empty. That's why we see so many suicides. People have tried and strived and they figure, well, there's nothing any better. Life can only get worse. I might as well just end it now and just put myself out of the pain. It's a tragedy when we hear stories of that. Maybe you have family or loved ones who have succumbed to that. There is hope out there, and the hope is in Jesus Christ. The hope is not in ourselves and not in the people around us. Sometimes the gods that people rely on are people around us, and when the people around us let us down, as they often do, then we are let down. We figure, well, if I can't trust them, I can't trust anybody. We can always trust God. God is faithful and true. So let's encourage people and point people towards that one true faithful friend who will never let us down.
Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, what a blessing it is to proclaim your word and the encouragement that we have, knowing that our eternity is sealed in heaven forevermore. What a great and glorious day that will be when our Savior's face we will see. We lift up those who are hurting in our lives, hurting in our families, the people around us who are hurting spiritually. They're searching for some fulfillment, some meaning in life. We know the answer because we have found that meaning in life. We found that fulfillment in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Help us to find ways to share that good news with those around us, Lord. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to burden our hearts. The Holy Spirit will continue to minister to, to them. Perhaps the next time that we bring a word of encouragement out of the Scriptures, perhaps they will be receptive that time and allow us to minister to them. Help us, Lord, to be effective ministers wherever we go. To be living epistles, living words, living letters of the grace and love and mercy of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray.